Throughout the ages, mankind has sought to learn the mysteries. Throughout time, mankind has decided that the concept of there is a God or there isn't a God, that's not enough. Man wanted the evidence of divine existence, but mankind wanted to just look upon the face of God. Some of mankind has sought to see the Creator's face and weep, plead and praise it, the eternal Creator, whilst the adversaries of man wanted to actually spit in the face of God and tell him that with all his omnipotence, omniscience and omnipresence, that we could do a better job. Mankind has always been a curious bunch. We aren't content with things. We want to know more. Actually, we crave it. We crave knowledge, even if in subtle degrees. We all exhibit this quality, be it philosophy and theorizing concepts like God, the meaning of life, the various layers of existence, or simple questions such as, where do stars come from? A question as simple as that can lead man to look at the stars. And the catalyst for power and knowledge is ignited. And that catalyst, my friends, is curiosity. Once curiosity peaks, we begin asking deeper questions. The more we analyze those stars, such as what are they made of? How many are there? Until the mind begins to wonder what else is out there? Once one question is answered, this doesn't satisfy the thirst for knowledge. It only seems to leave, leave us with another question, and then another, until we become adept at this. Until that young boy that stares at the star eventually goes from a curious child to an expert astronomer, looking further and further into the cosmic heavens and even pursuing other sciences like physics and such. The spiritual sciences of man are very much the same. Once we become aware that there are indeed non-physical forces deemed supernatural around us or spiritual and beyond, even within us at all times, these forces are everywhere. This seems to increase the spiritual curiosity of the individual, leading them to become the seeker. Just like that young curious child looking at the stars, gaining answers, we are left with more over time. Left with more questions, and this curiosity drove me wild. I knew there was an existence beyond this bleak, mortal coil. Once that curiosity beckoned, all that was left was to validate this theory. I was not going to take the word of some mere man sitting at his desk preaching about heaven and hell, whilst he would glorify the oppression of women and the abuse on innocent children without even knowing he was. I wasn't to take the word of such people. I ventured into the mysteries myself. This is one of the many reasons why the brotherhood and the sisterhood of the right hand path shunned me for a very long time. Because I dared even question them. I dared challenge their beliefs and faith. See, faith is nothing more but complete trust or confidence in someone or something based on a dogmatic convictions rather than proof. I did this as a child and I never made that mistake again. I trusted my carers, my mother, my father. I was left, I was inflicted with torment and neglect and abuse. I trusted my family and they destroyed me as a young child. As a maturing adult, that sticks with me, even until this day. It's traumatic. And I would never allow myself to trust again. Not like that, not blindly. This world is filled with lies and deceit. This is why caution is required in this world. And the truth must only be discovered by self. Alas, my reality and yours will never be identical. I must state that before my full immersion into the left-hand path and the dark arts, I must explain first my journey from curiosity to seeking. As I already explained, I knew there was an existence beyond the physical realm, the plane of flesh and substance. This can first be experienced as a feeling, a sensation if you will, a spiritual yet tangible energy. I began searching into the basics of meditation, circumvention of breath and visualization, tactile imaging. Once done, the energy was felt. Although it was only subtle, it was enough to stir up a powerful interest within me. The energy was only environmental, and now that I look, on, look back at it, it was rather uninteresting. Just a residual build-up in the environment. Yet at that time, it was fascinating. All I remember thinking was, how come I am actually feeling something? The concepts of this energy being real or false wasn't of any importance. It was real because I experienced it. That is enough to 
validate in order to dis to actually develop these spiritual arts. The important thing to remember is that whatever you are feeling, hearing, seeing, or experiencing in these transcendental states is what you are indeed experiencing. Don't question it. This will lead to overthinking and being over analytical. And sometimes it is good to question and analyze, but that is only to be done afterwards, not during the moment or the momentum. Once the energy was experienced subtly and lightly, I then opened up and became more receptive, receiving impressions and digesting all that came along with the experience. This left me with another question. Just like the stargazing curious child, I wanted to know what was it made out of? What was the source? How to not only feel it, but control it, see it, consume it, and manipulate it. I went from my in-depth studies into the actual work itself. It all began with energy work, Tai Chi, meditation, mantras, and so forth, yogic sciences. I then progressed and moved forward into stuff like candle magic, sympathetic magic, contagious magic. Afterwards, I got further into divination, soul travel, evocation, diving deeper and deeper into each of the mysteries, lurking in the darkness. During my younger years into immersing myself into ritual magic, I had joined a traditional witchcraft coven, which mostly leaned towards more Wiccan um, old school practices. There was definitely a local witchcraft store that sold crystals, wands, candles, books, herbs, and so forth. Yet in the back of the store, the old woman there would teach a class to the more younger generation, which I and the coven at the time belonged to. I agreed to join, and I mostly sat through the classes as a silent spectator, analyzing all that would be discussed. I would like to say debated, yet there was no debate there at all. One day before the class started, I asked about the books, which were hidden away apparently. As many apparently were supposed to be hidden from us. Hmm. So we wouldn't mess with stuff like the devil and stuff like that. I wanted the book on demonology. I had already owned some and read some, but I wanted to see if they had any of us available. The old woman gave me a look. It conveyed concern, worry, and almost seemed to be scornful in a way. I remember te her telling me not to get involved in stuff like that. In order to put her mind at ease, I just told her it was just for research. And she blatantly changed the subject, telling me to hurry to the class because it was about to start. This was the moment when I decided to open my mouth. As soon as the class would start, as she would have no choice but to give an answer, she asked us all, that attended midway through that if we had any queries or questions to raise our hand. I remember shaking in anticipation for her to ask that question. As soon as she did, I spoke up. I simply asked why did she dismiss my request to look at the books on demonology. At this moment she became a bit flustered and made sort of a safety announcement to us all that when it came to working with darkness, the devil or demons, that we would be damned. And she rambled on about superstitions of selling your soul and that black magic leads to an afterlife where we are slaves of the devil. You know, that typical stuff. At this particular moment, I didn't announce my interest in black magic or the fact that I was already uh, becoming a black magician. I just didn't have that title, so instead I simply stated that in order for us to understand the good and the benevolent, and the powers of light, that we should also become aware of both the darkness and everything else along with that too. Yet she dismissed this idea and acted sort of like a nervous priest when an atheist asks a dis difficult question. And the priest in question will say something like, well, God works in mysterious ways. She actually began to say any more talk of black magic or demons would lead to me being banned from the class and the whole shop. I then basically shut her down in front of the whole class and exposed her, saying that she wasn't a spiritual soul. She was scared, close-minded, and a dogmatic woman that sought to only control and restrict the onslaught of magical and occult knowledge. Needless to say, I was banned from the store. Yet to many observing, many who were even older than me, 
I was actually making a lot more sense than her. They even followed me after the class to learn a thing or two from me. It was at that moment that I began analyzing the so-called white magic and the right-hand path and the systems and traditions as being ridiculous. It was in that moment that I embraced my adversarial spirit and delved deeper into black magic, more than most people are willing or even daring to go. Spirituality and magic in my eyes were a path to limitless potential, a path to limitless power, where the concepts of good and evil were just that. They are man-made concepts that do not govern the cosmos or the facets of existence in any way. Light is not good. It is not evil. It is just light. Darkness is not good. Darkness is not evil. It is just darkness. I had obtained these realizations at an extremely young age, and it was apparent that the true path to godhood, to limitlessness, was a path that had no rules, no dogma, no limitations, and no restrictions. And that path was black magic. I left the restrictions and the grasp of the dogmatic coven, and I later on joined a lodge. A extremely sinister order that other groups in my area and further away. I rose through the ranks in the initiatory systems with such a ferocity that many of the highest degrees in these dark organizations started to feel threatened for some unknown reason. Eventually, I left that order, that group and that organization altogether. It was beneficial, although it was extremely difficult due to the inner deceit. I am not only a black magician, I don't just perform magic, I am magic, you know, I am infused with magic, I have seen the faces of the gods, demons, angels, spirits and various other spiritual races, I have witnessed them, marveled at them, even those demons that I met that terrified me, yet now I look at my own reflection and I am in awe and I am both terrified of the self simultaneously, see I am aware that I am like the Christ character, a saviour, and at the same time, I am like the Antichrist character, an adversary, a creator and a destroyer, darkness and light embodied in the flesh. This isn't me being edgy, nor is it me being a power-hungry, narcissistic, sociopathic individual. I say this with the realization that I am the microcosmic emanation of the macrocosm, that whatever exists externally also exists within. All the elements, energies, forces, entities, and planes of existence is within the self whilst being external simultaneously. We all have at our disposal a field of limitlessness. So when we work within such a unrestricted parameters, sometimes it can be dangerous. The powers of darkness and the powers of chaos are the powers most potent. These most potent forces are available to the black magician in order to achieve any goal or tackle any issue head on. Yet magic is like a gun. It can be used to hunt, to provide food and nourishment. It can be used for protection. You can choose to use the same gun for a baneful purpose. To go from a hunter to an assassin or a murderer. Yet at the same time, the gun can be so powerful that its power is sometimes too much to handle which can result in injury on the self. The right-hand path practitioner calls this bad karma or some type of cosmic justice. The black magician has done something wrong, so now they will receive the same fate, sometimes much worse by the law of the threefold law, you know, that type of thing. This is nothing but a scare tactic. The only time the power and forces may seem like they harm us or cause havoc in our lives is either because we mishandled those forces in arrogance or foolishness. The other reason is because we had to go through some sort of trial, some sort of test to push us into a hostile environment to see us conquer all the challenges, all the obstacles to make us better and a stronger person. Not everyone sees it that way though. And then the spirits of darkness and the infernal demons become scapegoats. They get the blame for our misfortune. See that the, these Catholic entities, they think that they only want to torment or torture us. But in actuality, this is incorrect. It is a matter of shifting one's own perception that is needed to withstand that storm. 
the Black Magician is by far the greatest and potentially the most dangerous force of nature. He slash she is an individual who has access to limitless knowledge and power. The Black Magician can wield both the unfathomable magnitude of knowledge and power without any rules, morals, restrictions. This is exactly like Mother Nature. It can be nurturing and provide us with shelter, food and care. Yet at the same time, Mother Nature can be a raging destroyer. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tornadoes, tsunamis, storms, floods, wildfires. The Mother Nature starts herself by striking down furious lightning upon her own self, resulting in a furious, ferocious, fiery blaze. She's willing to destroy herself in the process. In many ways, the Black Magician is exactly the same. Armed with the forces of magic, he or slash she can become a savior and he with love and compassion, as well as become, quite frankly, a murderer, a destroyer of lives, snuffing out their life and light. I knew, I knew not what I was to become. Alas, I would discover that this force of nature was something I would have to become. Actually, it was already what I was. I merely needed to awaken that dormant part of myself. Through study, through walking the path of magic and occultism, I gazed into the darkness and it gazed back. And at that moment, I knew I was a black magician. And I must admit to you that my entire young life has leaned towards different things. The seeking of power and knowledge. And the second is the seeking of fulfilling every desire. I remember being a very young child, seven years of old in fact, and I became mesmerized by my grandfather smoking a cigarette. I wanted to know why he did it, how it altered his mood, the joy that he may have felt from it, and the experience of it. Theorizing wasn't enough and I did something naughty as a child. I had smelt it, I had seen it, and now I wanted to taste, I wanted to consume it. I don't recommend this. I decided to smoke one. One morning, as he smoked out of the back garden, I rushed out of the home quickly. I noticed a half burning cigarette on the ashtray and without any hesitation, I picked it up and I put it straight to my lips and inhaled deeply, holding the smoke for a moment then finally releasing it slowly. At first it gave me a rush and sort of a bittersweet, I suppose, taste. It was harsh yet sort of enjoyable nonetheless. One drag of the cigarette into two, then three and four and on and on until it was gone and it was quite amazing regardless of the negative health issues or the addictive traits tobacco and cigarettes is branded with i didn't care you know i actually thoroughly enjoyed it and later on i would take this into a full swing smoking became a pleasure afterwards i sought out new ways to gain pleasure i wanted to marvel at every form of temptation and desire and throw myself into it such as the way of some of us black magicians Cigarettes, roll-ups, cigars, from tobacco to weed, smoking it in joints, blunts, papers, bongs, edibles. I then focus on alcohol, beer, lager, vodka, whiskey, absinthe, and so on. I then needed a deeper and more immersive experience. Psychedelics, for example, were a massive eye-opener for me. I then dived into other substances. And this was just for the experience. You know, I wasn't a drug addict, uh, and I'm not ashamed, and I still ain't. I never understood the need to feel shame for taking a substance of which is my own right to do so, my own free will. I can indulge in any substance I like without judgment or feeling guilt and shame, as long as I don't hurt someone else. Some things I enjoyed and could easily stop, some things I grew really fond of and continued to do, to do them, you know, smoking for one. Yet it changed, as I did. I reveled in the sin, the pleasure, the orgiastic rituals, celebrating all that life was, the light, the dark, the sacred, the forbidden, the flesh and the mind in accordance with the soul. There comes a time in every man and woman's life where we look in the mirror and have to take a deep look, not just at the surface, but deeper. We must then ask a variety of serious, profound questions to ourselves. One. Who are we? Not what we think we are, but who are we really? Peel off the mask, the mask we all wear, regardless if you are aware of it or not. We don't make this mask, it's made for us. 
by those who bring us up, by the media that we consume, by the society as a whole, who we are beneath the mask, at the core of ourself, who we really, really are. Number two, why are we here? What is our purpose? Why were we born? Why are we here at this moment in time? Are we supposed to contribute to something? What is the point in it all? Sometimes we make up our own purpose because we draw from others. Religious groups believe this is a test. It's all a part of some trial of some sort to see if we are worthy of an afterlife where we either suffer the worst of torments and the worst of horrors or the sheer delights and so-called paradise of praising a creator for eternity in heaven. These two questions can sometimes lead to midlife crises, uh, a midlife crisis. The mere contemplation of such questions can drive us to depths of confusion and depression. Let me enlighten you. I believe for a long time that I was the chosen one, that I was meant for some sort of supreme importance. In a way I was right, and in a way I was wrong. See, I wasn't meant to serve someone else's divine plan. The purpose of my existence is my purpose. Who I am and what I am is my choice. Yes, I am the chosen one, because that's what I chose, that's what I told myself, that's what I told my reality. I have a destiny, a purpose to my existence, and that purpose is the one that I made myself. We as black magicians need to wake up and realize that our purpose and who we are is of our choosing. This is the amazing quality of the left-hand path. All is permitted. All is debatable. Nothing is set in stone and everything is malleable. As I have said to many, existence is a game and we are both the, pro the programmers and the hackers. I am not saying that all of existence is some sort of computer simulation, nor am I disputing this theory either. I am merely stating that existence is more malleable than we realize. Our magic sort of acts as the cheat codes or the hacking menu to break those rules. The typical imagery many get when you mention a dark sorcerer or sorceress, which is in actuality the black magician, many imagine black hooded cloaks and some imagine a man or a woman in woods covered in blood and other imagine a wicked evil individual yet a black magician can look like anyone and can't be anyone most of them almost all of them look like your normal average man woman teen and even a child sometimes yet despite our appearance our style demeanor and personal characteristics they are deep down an outcast of society whether or not they know that, or others know it, let it be known the left-hand path is not only an empowering one, but an enlightening one. The right-hand path, or so-called middle path, would have you believe that enlightenment comes from their paths, and no others. Yet this is false, and furthermore, the black magician can attain unfathomable magnitudes of enlightenment, even beyond many others. Whilst in the order of the right-hand path, they believe that peace in non-attachment and the silencing of the mind and distilling the noise within can only then lead to enlightenment. This is a journey which can take years, decades and lifetimes utilizing such disciplines. What makes the enlightenment process of a black magician different? It's more of an illumination process and the speed of it too. It is unreal and terrifying and Instead of being at one with peace and gradually ascending through the dimensions of consciousness to the utmost enlightened, the black magician doesn't wait and he jumps into action, or she jumps into action, diving into a wormhole of absolute chaos, and it is a paradoxical mixture of things manifest and unmanifest, and experience, and sometimes the black magician will learn through pain and chaos, overcoming and ascending the worst of the worst. If instead of giving into the insult of chaos, Instead of falling to your knees at the force of it, stand there. It may feel like you're falling to the depths of insanity. Don't worry, you are. You are going insane, and that's okay. The term sanity these days has many definitions. And when we speak of the greater mysteries, logical and mathematical inclined observation is useless. Therefore, you get past that way of thinking, that very limited way of perceiving this reality. 
than to others, you will be a delirious individual. Don't concern yourself with the opinions of others, for the greatest minds in history were called insane. Yeah, fast forward, and they were right. Those that were once slandered and laughed at are now held in the utmost respect and seen as pioneers and geniuses. Once overwhelming chaos surrounds the black magician, they become it. They take it in, regardless of the sheer force of it. All the knowledge of chaos will distill into them, almost as if they are being uploaded. And afterwards, once they've returned to a normal mundane awareness, you sit down and all you're left with from the spiritual download, if you will, is a sequence of code through specific methods such as meditation, scrying, divinations, and so on. Those codes, which are you different and uniquely experienced by black magicians, will be deciphered, translated through the tunnels of perception and an instant knowing, a sudden spontaneous omniscience, if you will, will then be experienced in an altered trans transcendental state. The black magician then looks out to the world and doesn't just see it, but knows it, understands it, and is it a oneness with all things, and yet supporting and embodying individuality simultaneously. Looking out to the physical world, feeling the earth move, the spirits walk among them, they sense the connection that every human being has, not only a perception, but that we are all one, not just connected, we are source separated from source, experiencing source at a different angle, a different observation of perception, the fractal of existence experiencing it all, when we are it all. They don't even have to speak anymore or explain it. They know all and they feel all, yet are berated by a guru who will claim that this isn't real en enlightenment. You know, I have nothing to prove. I have nothing to show off. I have no reason to impress. We don't seek to impress. The black magician only seeks to impress their will upon the whole world and then does so through ritual, through spells. Regardless of the systems of limitation that try to sway us, false notions of an eternal afterlife of torment, a judging creator with a naughty list and a nice list like Santa Claus. Regardless of all those things, regardless of all that oppression and systems in control that would seek to oppress, destroy, or even sway the black magician, we do not stop. We will never stop. And we will continue to pursue. And that, my friends, is the black magician.